This is not an Arab phenomenon, it is a Jewish phenomenon. The Jews understood who is a prophet, the Arabs did not know who is a, or what is a, prophet. And that is why Allah says, That you can warn a nation who didn't have a prophet before them that they knew. Of course the prophet Abraham was there, but his legacy was almost forgotten. They didn't really know what is a prophet. And so Allah says, he had not sent a prophet before to uh, the Arab nation. And therefore, when the Arabs heard of this, that you are a prophet of God, the only other nation that they knew who believed in prophets were the Jews and Christians. And so they sent emissaries to the Jews, they sent emissaries to the people of the book, in order to say, okay, this is a phenomenon that is from your religion, it's happening in our culture. And we know it's not true, we don't believe in this. So why don't you tell us something that we can quiz the Prophet with? We can try to ask the Prophet Wasallam. and obviously because they thought he was a false Prophet, he was not going to be able to answer, so his lies will be exposed. And so they sent a number of delegations to Medina, at that time it's called Yathrib. And that is because Yathrib was the only place that were Jews living close by. And so they sent a number of delegations to Yathrib. In one such delegation, the Ahli Kitab said, ask him about Isaac uh, and Yaqub, Jacob, and Joseph, Yusuf. Because that is their lineage. The Jews are Bani Israel. And who is Israel? Israel is, who is Israel? Yaqub, right? So ask him about Yaqub and his father and his son. Ask him about what happened to the family of Yaqub. And so they went to the Prophet and they asked him about the family of Yaqub and Yusuf. And Allah revealed all of Surah Yusuf as a response to that. And Allah says in Surah Yusuf that you didn't know this story. You were not there when they plotted against Yusuf. Remember we did Tafsir Surah Yusuf? We talked about this, right? Now we link it to the seerah. That this is one of those questions the uh, Jews asked the Arabs to ask the Prophet Muhammad because the Arabs, the Quraysh, had no clue who jo Joseph was. And so the Prophet is quizzed, do you know who is Ya'qub, who is Jacob, and the family of Jacob, and what happened to the family of Jacob? The inner struggle between the children of Ya'qub. So the Prophet answered miraculously in one of the most beautiful surahs in the Quran that we spent uh, three, four months doing a tafsir of. And all of this goes back to one point of trying to quiz the Prophet Another famous incident occurred also, and this is again in the early Meccan phase, that uh, they sent a delegation to the Yathrib and they asked, what should we ask? Tell us some quiz questions to ask. And so they said, there are three questions we can tell you. Nobody would know this except a true prophet from the prophets of Israel. Because again, from them, they only understand the prophets of Israel. These are three questions only somebody who is from within that understanding will be able to tell us, otherwise he'll be, not be able to know. And so ask him about three things. Number one, ask him about the story of the young men who entered a cave and slept a long time. The young men who entered a cave and slept a long time. These are folklores and legends, only a prophet knows the details. Number two, ask him about a man who traveled the world from the east to the west and who had experiences that are legends. And number three, ask him about the ruh. What is the ruh and what is it made of? Where, what is it coming from? And so, and this is a report in Tirmidhi, and it is slightly weak, but again, it's, uh, we don't have a problem with weak traditions overall. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked these three questions, he responded confidently that come back to me tomorrow and I will tell you the answers to these three questions. And because he was overconfident, and because he didn't say, Insha'Allah, and this shows us who is the Rabb and who is the one who is the servant. This shows us who is the master and who is the slave of Allah. And the slave of Allah is not a derogatory title, it is the highest honor. And Allah calls the Prophet ﷺ the slave of Allah four times in the Quran. Four times. Right? Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Tabarakah the Nazifaqan ala abdihi. Four times Allah calls the Prophet Sallam Abd. And this is not derogatory. It is the height of praise because Allah is saying, This man is my chosen servant. He is my perfect worshipper. There is no honor for a human higher than being a worshipper of Allah and a slave of Allah. And so Allah says, This is my slave. And therefore, uh, the Prophet expressed overconfidence and he didn't say, Insha'Allah. And so, instead of one day, it was dragged on to 
two weeks. And the Quraysh began to mock the Prophet ﷺ that what has your false spirit abandoned you? What has happened? And eventually Allah revealed, as you all know, Surah Al-Kahf. All of Surah Al-Kahf came down. Surah Al-Kahf was a response to these three questions. And these three questions are all answered in Surah Al-Kahf. Of course, the, the, the story of Kahf comes from the men of the cave, right? Tell them the story of the men in the cave, what happened. And so details are given that even the Jews did not know. But these are found in the Qur'an. Similarly, the Prophet is asked about the man who traveled uh, all over the world from east to west and nobody knew who he was. And so Allah revealed that this is Dhul Qarnayn. Now point here, some people say that Dhul Qarnayn was Alexander the Great. There is n not just no evidence for this, it is in fact contrary to many things that we know. Alexander the Great was a well-known pagan. His Sheikh was Aristotle. Aristotle was the private tutor of Alexander the Great. And there is no question that Alexander the Great was a pagan idol worshipper. And Aristotle was a believer in the gods of the Greek mythology. And so Dhul Qarnayn is not Alexander. And there's other things as well, uh, which is not the place to get into. But Dhul Qarnayn is a figure we don't know who he is. He's not mentioned in Western sources. But he seems to have been a, a worldwide uh, traveler. Was he a prophet or not? Scholars have differed uh, about this, was the, whether he was a prophet or just a king. Allah knows best. And then the third question was about the spirit. And Allah revealed in the Quran, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They ask you about the spirit. The spirit is from the affairs of Allah, from the mysteries of Allah, and no one knows about the spirit except for, or sorry, no one knows about knowledge. None of you have been given knowledge except for a little bit. And therefore, the spirit, Allah did not answer about it. But he answered that this is of the mysteries of Allah that you're never going to know. And so the trick question was in fact answered in that the Jews knew that nobody has knowledge of the spirit. And so if he had answered a detailed knowledge, then it would have been against the question. Because the question was a trap, it was a trick question. That the spirit is one of the mysteries of Allah, nobody will understand what is the human soul. And so the Jews, now the two, other two questions, facts came out, right? The third question was a double trick, if you get the point here, right? And the answer was no answer. Because if he had answered, he would have shown, according to the Jewish knowledge, that he is not a prophet. Because certain knowledges Allah has kept to himself. And of the knowledge that he has kept to himself is the nature of the spirit. And to this day, we don't really know what the spirit is, right? Modern science doesn't even believe in it anymore, right? But all of mankind, one of the interesting points, every single culture on earth, every single civilization that has been documented, even ones that we have discovered in the past, Two or three or four things are common amongst all of them. And again, this is an anthropology sub, sub, uh, tangent, but just for your information, number one, religiosity. We have never discovered, and there will never be, a discovery of an atheistic nation. It's against human nature to not believe in a God, right? And so every single society that we've come across, modern or pre-modern, that is still living in the jungles of Brazil or Africa or the Aborigines or pre-modern, they have number one, religiosity. Number two, they believe in the human soul. Every single nation on earth, every single society has beliefs in the human soul. Number three, they believe in evil spirits. Call them ghosts, call them jinns, call them ghouls. They believe in a power, an entity beyond our entity. Other things as well that comes to mind right now, subhanAllah, a very amazing thing. Every single society believes in a great flood myth. It's called the great flood myth because modern Anthropologists considered to be a myth, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that every single society believes that there was a massive flood. And this is something, Google it, if you don't believe me, look at this up yourself. The Aborigines have a flood myth. The Native American Indians who have been cut off from Western civilization for, you know, 10,000 years they've been cut off from um, before Columbus came. They've been cut off for 10,000 years. And they have a great flood myth that they have this, this notion that uh, a great flood destroyed all of humanity and they have a, a savior. The ancient Hindus, the Vedas, if you look at the Vedas, the ancient Hindu scriptures, they have an, a flood myth and they say that from the waters of the flood, the one man came. And what is the name of this man in Hinduism? Does any... 
person to remember from India, Pakistan, you should, this is folklore. Well, it's Indian folklore. Manu, Noah, Manu, the, the Noah is there. Manu is the, 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 the this isn't the ancient Vedas, right? Even the N-A is, is there, but they have an M in front of it, Manu. My point being, uh, this was a trick question. The Jews knew nobody has the knowledge of the Ruh. The, and so if the Prophet had answered, he would have actually shown that he's not a true prophet, right? And so he answered the first two in detail, and that's in Surah Al-Kahf. And the third one in Surah Al-Kahf clearly also says that no one knows the Ruh. And you have only been given a little bit about knowledge. So this was another tactic that they tried and they failed in this tactic as well. The ninth tactic that they used is outright torture. Outright torture. Now, as we said over and over again, the Arabs of old were a tribal society. Everything was based upon tribalism. And therefore, your protection is based upon who will protect you. Not the law, not the government, but rather your own tribe. And therefore, those who had tribal bonds, like the Prophet ﷺ, like Abu Bakr, like others, they were somewhat protected. Somewhat even though they too faced hardships. We'll talk about that as well today and, and, and inshallah next Wednesday. But overall, their status of Quraysh, being Quraysh, protected them. However, as we know, many of the earliest converts were from the slaves and the mawali. A mawali, a mawla, uh, it's a very common term. You'll find it in Islamic literature. You'll find it in the seerah. A mawla is a freed slave. And in those days, uh, a slave could be freed for many reasons. Uh, of them is that you, uh, a freed slave w had more liberty than uh, uh, an actual slave. And so many times an owner would free a slave and then make him a mawla. And what this means is that in English is called a client relationship. What this means is that the freed slave is still... S you know the concept of indentured servants is something similar to that, right? Is that it's not fully free, but the, 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 the man owes his allegiance to his master. And this is called Mawla. And in Islam, Islam came and gave some rules for Mawla. Uh, and therefore, you know, there's even Mawlas uh, in, uh, in Islam as well. Uh, so we said that there was outright torture to the slaves and the Mawali, the Abid and the Awali, uh, Mawali. Sa'id ibn Jubayr asked Ibn Abbas, Sa'id ibn Jubayr is the main student of Ibn Abbas. Sa'id ibn Jubayr asked Ibn Abbas, how did the pagans torture the Muslims? What happened? So he's incurious, he's curious, he's inquisitive. What is happening in early Islam? Was the torture really that bad? Now again, these are Sa'id ibn Jubayr. There are no Sira books he's reading. His knowledge comes from living authorities. Ibn Abbas is a living authority. And so Sa'id ibn Jubayr asked Ibn Abbas, what, are the, what happened? So Ibn Abbas responded that the believers were tortured in early Islam so severely and they were starved and they were deprived of water until they could not even sit up out of pain. They would have to be almost semi-conscious on the ground. And until one of them would be told, Is Allah and Al-Uzza your God? And they would respond, Yes, Allah is my God. Yes, Al-Uzza is my God. Just to get rid of the torture. In fact, Ibn Abbas says, So much so that if an insect passed by them, and they would have been asked, Is this insect your God? They would have responded, Yes, it is my God. Just to get rid of that torture. And as we know in Islam, alhamdulillah, we have this concession given that if you are tortured to death, then you're tortured almost to death, you may uh, say whatever you want and your heart remains firm in Islam. The main culprit behind all of this torture was none other than uh, Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was the main culprit and Abu Jahl had a series of tactics he would do. If the person who converted was from the nobleman of Quraysh, then he could not touch him. So he would begin verbal abuse and he would taunt and ridicule without touching him because if you touched him, the Quraysh would respond back. If he were a businessman who's doing business with the Quraysh, then he would initiate a boycott. No more buying and selling in Mecca. And if he were from the slave and the mawali, then Abu Jahl would tell the owners and he would participate himself uh, in physically trying to kill or torture uh, slaves. And so Abu Jahl participated in multiple torture sessions. And as you know, Abu Jahl, the Prophet ﷺ called him the Fir'aun of my Ummah. There is nobody who is more evil in early Islam than Abu Jahl. Even Abu Lahab is not as vile and cursed as Abu Jahl is. And 
There's a, a famous story in uh, Bukhari by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, who said that uh, the first people, the first group of seven who embraced Islam, he mentioned them, they were himself, Ibn Mas'ud was, was one of those, Abu Bakr and Ammar and his mother Sumayya and Suhaib and Bilal and Al-Miqdad. These are the names that Ibn Mas'ud mentions, that himself, Abu Bakr, Ammar, Ibn Yasir, his mother Sumayya, Suhaib, Bilal, Suhaib is the Roman, Suhaib al-Rumi, Bilal al-Habashi, and Al-Miqdad. And then he goes on. As for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah protected him through his uncle Abu Talib. And this shows us the wisdom of why Abu Talib remained a pagan till he died. I mentioned this two weeks ago. As for Abu, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu his uncle protected him. Allah protected him through his uncle. Also notice the beautiful way of phrasing it. Allah protected him through his uncle. He didn't say his uncle protected him. Because all of it goes back to Allah. Allah protected him through his uncle. As for Abu Bakr, then Allah protected him through his own tribe, the Banu Qahafa. Allah protected him through his own tribe. And as for the rest of them, then the Quraysh rounded them up and began torturing them. So the rest of them are Ammar, his mother Sumayya, Suhay, Bilal, and Al-Miqdad. And he mentions they would sometimes put iron on their bodies and take them out into the sand and leave them there. And every one of them, this is Ibn Mas'ud narrating, every one of them eventually gave up. And said what the Quraysh wanted them to say. Of course, this is allowed. Nothing wrong with that. So uh, the ones, the ones that you know, uh, uh, others that we mentioned, they basically gave up, and they said what they wanted to say, except for Bilal ibn Abi Rabah, Bilal al Habashi, except for Bilal ibn Masud says. Bilal considered his soul not worth anything in front of Allah. He was willing to give up his soul. He considered his soul insignificant. And he refused to budge one bit. And so they concentrated their efforts on him. And they did to him what they did to nobody else. And Ibn Mas'ud said, I myself saw that Bilal was handed over to the ruffians, the teenagers, the gangs of Mecca. You know, every society has riffraff. Every society has people who just do, you know, I mean, they, they don't have any life of their own. And they're just people who live for the moment, the pleasures. And so Bilal was handed over to this group of ruffians, of gangs. And they would run around with a rope around his neck and drag him through the streets of Medina. All the while he was saying, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. This is what Bilal is famous for. He is crying Tawheed. He is crying the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And of course, the, the, it didn't help that the owner of Bilal, the owner of Bilal was one of the uh, worst of the Quraysh, and that is Umayyat ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, uh, personally participated in the torture of Bilal. Now realize it's a delicate line that you're drawing because slaves are very expensive materials and goods, right? Slaves are more expensive than camels. Slaves are more expensive than houses. And therefore, if you want to punish your slave, you are harming your own income. You see the, the conundrum here that slaves are precious property. You know, many people daydream once upon a time there were slaves and whatnot, and we wish we could have them. A'udhu billah, but yeah, the point being, the slaves are much more expensive, you know. You don't think they're like five, ten dollars. They would have been in the equivalent of fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, right? And so it's a massive amount of money. It's counterintuitive to beat your own slave. Because you want him to live a long life. And you want him to serve you. Right? So this shows us the depths of their animosity. It shows us how much hatred they have. They are destroying their most precious property. Because human life is the most precious property that they own. You can buy an animal for much cheaper than you can buy a slave. And for them to be torturing the slaves in this manner really shows uh, the depths of their own uh, profanity, if you like. And so Umayyah ibn Khalaf, would, he had a sadistic streak. It's pretty obvious when you read the, the stories. Uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf would personally take Bilal into the desert in the morning and put a large rock. He had other slaves as well. The other slaves would put a rock on his chest and leave him there without food, without water, trapped and pinned under the rock throughout the day when the sun is now at its zenith and its height. And uh, many people narrate to us more than one Hassan ibn Thabit who is from Medina. He's an Ansari. Of course, at the time, he's not a Muslim. Hassan ibn Thabit says, I remember doing Hajj in the days of Jahiliyyah. I remember doing Hajj and I saw how severely Bilal was being tortured, and 
I wondered how he is still alive. This is Hassan ibn Thabit uh, speaking. Amr ibn al-As, uh, also one of the, he's one of the, uh, uh, the leaders of the Quraysh. Amr ibn al-As, he himself narrates that when he was not a Muslim, Amr was not a Muslim. I passed by Bilal when he was being punished upon the rocks of the desert. The rocks were so hot, this is uh, Amr ibn al-As saying, that if I were to have put raw meat on them, eventually would have cooked and I could have eaten it. The rocks were so hot in this desert sun that it's, you can cook literally on it. And this is literally true. It's not just a, a phrase uh, like that. And Bilal was there for the entire day. And I heard him saying, أَكْفُرُوا بِاللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّى وَأُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ I reject Allah and Al-Uzza and I will believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Umayyah continued to try to uh, punish him, uh, but, he con but he refused to budge and he kept on saying, أَحَدٌ 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 And uh, many years later, Urwat ibn Zubayr, the nephew of Aisha, narrated, uh, many years later, Urwat narrated that Bilal was tortured by the people of Mecca and by, and by Umayyah ibn Khalif in particular, but he never even gave them one word to please them. In other words, he didn't budge one word. Most of the others who were tortured, they had to collapse and they agreed. And they are completely forgiven. Allah knows we would have given up way before even they had. Uh, but Bilal was one of those few who remained all the way to the end. And look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him. For we as Muslims firmly believe that there's an expression, uh, memorize this expression, it's a common expression in Arabic, and it goes back to our religion, even though it's not a hadith, a lot of people think it is a hadith. al jazau min jins al-amal. The reward or the punishment will be the exact same as what you were doing to get that reward or that punishment. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ If you do ihsan, Allah will give you ihsan. And if you do evil, Allah will give you evil. So your reward will be based upon, will be the same type as what you did. And so will your punishment be. al jazau min jinsil amal. And this is a maxim, this is a rule that we apply in our religion, that Allah Azza wa Jal will either punish or reward based upon and in the same type of what you did. So, look here, this is Bilal. He is yelling at the top of his lungs. He's screaming, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. Hassan ibn Thabit can hear his torture. He cannot hear what Umayyah is saying. All he can hear is Bilal screaming out, I reject Allah and Al-Uzza and I believe in Allah. And so he hears the torture. Wherever he is in Mecca, he can hear it. Eventually, what is Bilal rewarded with? We all know Bilal is rewarded by becoming the first and the most important and the only official mu'adhin of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As he was calling out the unity of Allah in Mecca, persecuted and alone, eventually when Islam reached its pinnacle and it became powerful, he would announce the unity of Allah instead of in humiliation at the pinnacle of Izzah. And he would announce the best and the most perfect adhan. Because when the dream of the adhan was told to the Prophet ﷺ, one of the Sahaba said, I saw a dream about the adhan. The Prophet ﷺ himself chose Bilal and he said, Go teach Bilal this because he has the best voice amongst you. He has the best voice amongst you. So the Prophet ﷺ chose Bilal to be the uh, mu'adhin. And therefore, the voice that was persecuted for the sake of Allah, the voice that was calling out one, 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 was the voice that is calling out Allahu Akbar, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And when the Prophet ﷺ reconquered Mecca in the eighth year of the Hijrah and he cleansed it of all of the idols, the first thing that he did, he commanded Bilal to climb on top of the Kaaba. And that very Bilal, whose voice of Ahadun Ahad could be heard in the valleys of Mecca, being persecuted. Right? That same voice was then hoisted on top of the Kaaba at the pinnacle of honor, at the height of dignity. And he was told to give the first adhan ever in the sacred precincts of the Haram. And so the first voice to ever call out to Eid in Mecca, all the valleys of Mecca, out loud was the voice of Bilal ibn Abi Rabah. And look at how Allah rewarded Bilal as he was being as he was being persecuted by the Quraysh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him. And look at the blessings of the Mu'addin, subhanAllah, so many blessings of the Mu'addin that our Prophet sallallahu said, our Prophet sallallahu said, that if people knew how much reward would be in the giving the adhan and in standing in the first row, and they had no other way out other than by drawing lots, 
they would have drawn lots in order to give adhan or to stand in the first row. What this means is that uh, the fact of the matter is that people don't know how important it is, and so, you know, whoever first come, first serve, and you know, whatever, it's no big deal. But if they really understood how much blessing was there, then they would not just give it up, and they would demand, let's be fair here, we'll just have anonymous lots, it's going to pull, who gets to have the first row, who gets to have the adhan? If they knew how blessed it was. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Ibn Majah, that any mu'adhin who gives adhan, whatever hears his adhan from animate or inanimate object, min rutbin wala yabis, it literally means wet or dry, but the meaning of wet in Arabic here is it's moist, meaning it's a living entity. Yabis, it means rock and stone and trees, right? So no entity, living or, or dead, animate or inanimate, will hear the adhan except that it will testify for him. And in the hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said to a shepherd uh, uh, that uh, I have been told you are a shepherd, whenever you are in your lands, give the adhan, even if you are alone. It's sunnah to give the adhan, because no jinn or ints will hear your voice, except that on the day of judgment, they will testify to what you have said. So they will testify to your iman. Now, subhanAllah, can anybody... Click the one plus one together here. The one person who's giving adhan in front of the Prophet Sallallahu right? What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? Whoever hears the adhan, what will he do? Testify on behalf of the mu'adhin, right? And who was the mu'adhin of the Prophet Sallallahu by designation and appointment? Bilal. And whose adhan did the Prophet Sallallahu hear five times a day in Medina? Back and forth, morning and evening, for 13, for more than, well, 10 years here and then uh, in Mecca as well, whenever they gave the Adhan and Darul Alqam, as we're going to talk about, at least 11, 12 years, right? He is hearing non-stop, every single time, the voice of Bilal. And he is the one saying that the Mu'adhin, whoever hears his voice, will testify on behalf of the Mu'adhin on the Day of Judgment. So subhanAllah, look at how the, the darajah, the maqam of Bilal ibn Abi Rabah, and of course our Prophet has many more a hadith about the blessings of the Adhan. Uh, of course, of them is the fam famous hadith in Bukhari, that the Mu'adhins will have the longest necks on the Day of Judgment. What does it mean they're going to have the longest necks? It doesn't mean they're going to be like giraffes. Atwaru uh, a'naqan, it's an expression in Arabic, it could mean they will have the greatest honor. Because, uh, again, Arabs love, uh, the classical Arabic loves uh, symbolism, right? And so, when you look up to somebody, this means he is worthy of honor, right? And therefore, if he has a long neck, this means, even in English we say, I'm looking up to you. Even in English, you know, even though he might be shorter than you, looking down at him, right? But I'm looking up to you, meaning you respect him. Okay, and so the meaning of the Mu'adhin will have the longest neck, uh, it primarily means they will be the most respected on the Day of Judgment. Right? All of these are hadith about the blessings of the Mu'adhin and the official Mu'adhin of the Prophet is Bilal. Another early name that we just mentioned is Khabbab. Khabbab ibn al-Arat. And Khabbab ibn al-Arat was one of the first ten converts of Islam as well. And he was a slave an Arab slave, and generally they treated Arab slaves better than non-Arabs. You know, as you know, it was a racist society, so Arab slaves had it a little bit better. And so Bilal really was the most tortured because he was not even an Arab. He was an Abyssinian. And by the way, I have to point out here as well, subhanAllah, look at the psychology of that society that uh, the riffraff, the ruffians, the youth can torture this slave and drag him through the streets with a, with a rope around his neck. I mean, this is the height of... of Barbarity, right? And he, even if these these teenagers that they're giving Bilal over to, these ruffians, they have no, nothing at stake other than sadistic pleasure, basically, right? And the only way that you can get away with this as a society is to dehumanize a group of people. Consider them to be just not even human. And we've seen in history what the Nazis did to the Jews, right? That you have no sympathy, no mercy, mother, woman, child, doesn't matter, elderly. It's just this sense, or not just to the Jews, to the Gypsies, to the Romanians, to anybody they didn't like. The Nazis had this, we are superior. And therefore anybody who's not of their race becomes de he's not even human. And therefore whatever happens, society doesn't pay attention. You see, all of society sees this torture happening to Bilal. They don't blink an eyelid. Because for them, 
Bilal is not human. Because, or you, know, you see what I'm saying? It's just, they're not, they're not considering any respect given because he's not an Arab or he's not a Qurashi. Especially Qurashi. And of course they have, and that's why Islam came and demolished this whole jahiliya of having caste systems based upon one's lineage and based upon one's skin color. Uh, the Arab slaves, and there were Arab slaves as well, obviously non-Qurashi, there was no such thing as a Qurashi slave, obviously, right? All slaves are from inferior classes. You cannot enslave your own. And so you have Iraqi slaves, you have Yemeni slaves, slaves that are, you know, Ibn Mas'ud is from a tribe in Yemen. Right, so he's, uh, he's one of the Arab slaves. Uh, Khabbab ibn Arat was one of the Arab slaves. And his master uh, actually was female, not, not a male. And, and her name was Ummi Anmar. Ummi Anmar. And Ummi Anmar uh, purchased uh, uh, Khabbab because Khabbab was a sword maker. He was a forger, an ironsmith, and he would hammer out swords. He would make swords for the people of Mecca. And he was one of the earliest converts to Islam. And when Ummi Anmar found out that he converted, she immediately went and gathered a gang together. She's a woman. What's she going to do? Right? So she gathers others together. She didn't have a husband. She gathered others together and told them to beat up Al Khabbab. And Khabbab ibn Arat said that I came back and I saw a whole group of Quraysh around me at my place of work and they began to taunt and ridicule me uh, about where were you, what have you done until I confessed I'm a Muslim. They had been told by Ummi and Mar. And when I confessed I'm a Muslim, they began hitting me so much the next thing I woke up and I was bodied and bl bloodied and bruised. He didn't even remember what had happened because they completely beat him up. And his, uh, his masters, Ummi and Mar, would many times when he was working in the, uh, uh, to make that iron and to make the, uh, the, the, the swords, she would take some of that iron that he had just taken out and she would use it to burn the back of Khabbab ibn al-Arat. Now Khabbab cannot do anything physical because if he does, he's going to die. This is a Qurashi lady. So she, he would use it to burn the back of Khabbab ibn al-Arat. And many years later, uh, when Umar was the Khalifa, Khabbab ibn al-Arat visited Umar once in Medina. And so Khabbab said, tell me some of the stories about Umm Anmar. Tell me, what did she used to do to you? He didn't say anything. He just turned around and he took off his shirt. And he showed his back to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Umar said, Wallahi, I have never seen anything as I have seen today. And he made him sit with him on the majlis and he gave him a lot of uh, honor. And subhanAllah, once the Prophet ﷺ passed by Khabbab while he, and the screams were coming from his shop. And so the Prophet ﷺ passed by and he sees what Ummi Anmar is doing. Ummi Anmar is taking that iron and putting it on. And, and basically, you, you can imagine the worst type of torture. There is no torture worse than fire, right? And that is why in our religion, in fact, we are prohibited, even when the state has to kill and execute, we are prohibited from execution and, and killing by fire. The Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Bukhari, no one is going to, is allowed to kill by fire except the creator of the fire. Or no one can punish by the fire except the creator of the fire. Because fire is the worst type of torture imaginable. It is nothing is more painful than that. And Khabab was tortured by this caltering uh, metal put on his back over and over again. When the Prophet ﷺ saw him in this state, he raised his hand. He said, Oh Allah, please help Khabab. Unsur Khabab. Help him against his enemy. Be on his side against his enemy. And subhanAllah, that's it. The dua came. And so what happened? A few days later, Umm Anmar woke up and she had a type of sickness and disease that she was acting like a rabid dog. Panting around and crawling around the house, she became like completely, she lost her senses. And the doctors of Mecca came, whoever was, they had their own ways of medicine, and they said, that's the only cure that we can think of is that she be cauterized. And what is cauterization? It is to burn the skin. Those, they, had, they had a system of burning the skin, which is still practiced in some cultures and countries that a small wound is maybe burned or festered or something like this. And so they said, this is a type of disease. We had, the only cure that we can think of that might possibly work is to cauterize her on the back and the head. <laughs> and so this was done to her. كَمَا تَدِينُ تُدَانْ الْجَزَاءُ بِنْ جِنْسِ الْعَمَلِ this was done to her and she died as a result of this. And that was just her punishment in this dunya. As for what awaits her in the next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But this shows us, as we said, al-jaza'u. What is the maxim in Arabic? Al-jaza'u? 
من جنس العمل right the same thing uh, or in Arabic it's also كما تدين تدان as you do it will, it shall be done uh, unto you and the torture of Khabab was in fact so severe that it was Al-Khabbab who went to the Prophet and I'll mention this hadith, if not today, the next Wednesday. It was Al-Khabbab who went to the Prophet when the Prophet was sitting in the shade of the Kaaba along with another group of Sahaba. This is in Bukhari. And Al-Khabbab was the one who said, Ya Rasulullah, ila mata? For how long? How long can we bear this, Ya Rasulullah? How long are we going to be tortured like this? Can't you just ask Allah to bring about Izza and glory? Can't you just get rid of this state of humiliation? And uh, there's a famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with his back against the Kaaba, the shade of the Kaaba. He stood or he, he put his back up and he said, Verily the people before you were tortured more than you. And he mentioned some of their tortures that they would be sawed in half and this and that would happen. And this would not prevent them from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verily I tell you that Allah will fulfill this matter. Allah will fulfill this matter. You are complaining to me about persecution and humiliation. A time will come when a woman can travel from Hadramaut to Sana'a, i.e. in the periphery regions, far away from Mecca. And there's so much safety for her. The only thing she's worried about is a wolf attacking her sheep. She's scared of Allah and then she's scared of a wolf attacking her sheep. It will be so much security in the land. You're worried about this from now. This is Al-Khabbab is the one. Of course Al-Khabbab, what else do we know about Al-Khabbab? Who can tell me? Very famous story about Al-Khabbab. <laughs> no, that's not Al-Khabbab ibn Al-Arat. That's Hudayfa ibn Al-Yaman. Khabbab should ring a bell among some people. Famous story of Khabbab. Umar ibn Khattab's sister. Umar comes to his sister's house to kill her, remember? And who is in the house of Fatima bint al Khattab? Khabbab. And this shows us that even as a slave, he's secretly volunteering his time to teach Islam to other people. As a slave, he's going secretly to the house of other people to teach them the Quran. And this shows us that he was one of the more knowledgeable of the Sahaba. And Al-Khabbab participated, now his ma master, his mistress died. Uh, Al-Khabbab participated in all of the expeditions of the Prophet Sallallahu And he lived up until the 17th year of the Hijrah. Now, Umar had an interesting policy. This is a little bit different sub subject here. Abu Bakr had one policy, Umar had another. Abu Bakr had a policy that all of the Sahaba should get the same salary from the government. And when he was asked about this, he goes, who am I to prefer one over another? Allah knows who has taqwa. Everybody should get the same stipend. Everybody gets the same salary, right? Umar, when he came, he said, no, I don't agree with this policy. Those who accepted Islam earliest will get grade A pay. And grade B will be those who accept in the second, third, fourth. And the lowest pay will be for those who accepted Islam the last. Now, ironically, and of course, this is Umar here, that put him at a grade C basically. Right? There was a whole group of people before him. And this shows us that he's not doing this to prefer himself. Because even he is basically not even the first batch, not the second batch. He's in 6th, 7th BH. He's way after all of these people. So Khabbab is getting one of the highest salaries any Muslim is getting. Because he's of the top 10. Right? And the top 10 is still alive. I mean, Abu Bakr was there and a few more were there. Uh, uh, Bilal and Khabbab. This batch were getting the largest salary uh, from Baytul Mal. And so Khabbab, with this salary, he was living in Kufa at the time. He built himself a modest house. And uh, he built a... Or he had a sunduq al-mal, it's like a, a treasure box, let's say, that was open, no key. And it was known in the city, anybody who has any monetary problems can simply take it from the house of Khabbab with no questions asked. You come and you take whatever you need and you go. No questions asked. So the money that he got, he is spending it basically, you know, the bulk of it is spent on the, the fuqara and he has built for himself a, a, a house. And when he was about to die, it's a famous story of Khabbab, when he was about to die, uh, he began to cry on his deathbed. And the people around him and his children said, why are you crying? You have suffered so much, you have reached the highest level. And you will meet the Prophet ﷺ. And he died, by the way, in 37 uh, AH, if I'm not mistaken. 30, uh, 37 AHS. So why are you crying? And so, he said, I am not crying out of pain. I'm not crying out of fear 
of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am crying because of what you see around you, this house. What will I answer Allah for my luxurious living? Verily, I was with a group of people. All of us were on equal footing. And all of us were being tortured and punished. But every one of them has gone before me without tasting the sweetness of this world. And Allah has left me to enjoy the fruits of this world. And I am scared that because I've enjoyed the fruits of this world, my share of the next will not be as much as the share of my companions. SubhanAllah. He's crying about this because he's saying, I knew a group, and then he was brought his kafan. Now he is a wealthy man now, even though he's not living a wealthy life, but he is. And his kafan, beautiful large sheet, is being prepared in front of him. He's on his deathbed. He's literally going to die the same day. And he begins to cry again. And he goes, Wallahi, I remember Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't even have enough cloth for his own kafan. And if they covered his face, his legs would be bare. And if they covered his legs, his face would be bare. And here I have this luxurious kafan in front of me. What will I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with? And so this is Al-Khabbab ibn al-Arad subhanAllah. What a story of Iman. Uh, and this is one of the earliest converts of Islam as well. Again, there's so many stories. And again, it's interesting and important to know these stories. I mean, of course, the story that I grew up is, was my favorite story because it, that was the name my father gave me. The story of Yasir and his family, right? Because Yasir and his wife Sumayya and their son Ammar, of course Ammar is named because of this as well, my own son Ammar. Uh, and I was Abu Ammar even before I met Umm Ammar. Right? I had taken the kunya Abu Ammar because I had made it up. Uh, I wasn't searching for any uh, Sumayya, don't worry, my wife is sitting in the back. Don't worry, it's like, alhamdulillah, it was all written, alhamdulillah. Um, but I was already Abu Ammar uh, because of, of course of the name of Ammar. And of course the family of Yasir and the family of Ammar is one of the best known examples of uh, the sacrifices of early Islam. And subhanAllah, one of the things that is really touching about this story is that in every one of these cases, it is the person himself being tortured. But in the case of Yasir and Sumayya, and they had two sons, Abdullah and Ammar, they are a family being tortured in front of each other. And that's why their story is even more pitiful. Because wallahi, every man to think of being tortured himself is tough enough. Then to think of your wife and your children being tortured in front of you, I mean, this is the nightmare of nightmares. You cannot get worse than this. And this is what happened with Yasir and with Sumayya. That they are tortured with their two children. And Abdullah was the older son and Ammar was the younger son. And so all four of them are slaves. And again, they are from uh, a slave client of Arabs. And the, their, their, their Mawla tribe was the Banu Bakr. And so they're, be, they're being tortured in front of one another. Uh, there's a lot of narrations about how they were killed, but one thing is for sure is that Yasir and Sumayya became the first martyrs of Islam, one after the other. Yasir and Sumayya became the first martyrs of Islam, and their torture was the most pitiable in all of Mecca. And that is why the Prophet is authentic, and the hadith is authentic. Uh, and of course, I love this hadith as well. The Prophet said, Sabran ala Yasir. فَإِنَّ مَوْعِدَكُمُ الْجَنَّةِ We ask Allah Azza wa to make that dua applicable to all of us, insha'Allah ta'ala. The Prophet said, Be patient, O family of Yasir. Sabran ala Yasir. And this is when he passed them by and they were all being tortured in front of his eyes and he couldn't do anything. SubhanAllah, can you imagine how painful it must be even for our Prophet to see this torture and not be able to do anything. So he said, Be patient, O family of Yasir. Indeed, your place that is appointed for you by Allah, it is Jannah. And so Yasser was the first to die and people have differed or early authorities have differed uh, about exactly how some people say that he was dragged in the streets with a rope. Others say that horses pulled him apart. We don't know what brutal pleasure they took. And this made his wife Sumayya, of course, even more full of iman and bitter and angry. And one, uh, maybe the next day, we don't know. Again, stories are so scant here. Try to do research and we really don't have much. But we just know that uh, when Abu Jahl then came to her, uh, she rebuked Abu Jahl. As a slave, you don't do this, right? And so Abu Jahl took a spear and... Uh, may Allah forgive uh, yani, uh, us for even saying this, but he, he, he thrust it up her private area all the way up and he killed her in this brutal, vicious, inhumane manner. And this is in front of yeah, uh, Ammar and Muhammad. And so the two are killed like this and then they turn on Muhammad and eventually they kill him. This is all happening one after the other. And then they turn on Ammar ibn Yasir. And at this time he's probably around 15 years old. Probably a young, uh, maybe even less than this. Uh, and 
they turn on him and he this this kid has seen too much he has he cannot take any more and so he gives up and he succumbs and the, he's the youngest of the four so they let him go and subhanallah he's just seen his father killed his mother killed he's seen his brother thrown into a ditch and now he comes running to the prophet sallam in darul arqam and he's crying and he says ya rasulullah i uttered words of kufr i i said statements of shirk you know what am i going to do now subhanallah it's now blanked out his mother father become secondary because i've disobeyed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what am i going to do and allah and the prophet sallam asked him how do you find your faith in your heart you know he goes as it always is i haven't changed anything in here they can only change this they can't change this and so the prophet sallam said if they return then you return in other words if they do the same thing to you back then you do back what you just did right now, not a problem. And Allah revealed Surah Al-Nahl. Surah Al-Nahl was revealed. And in Surah Al-Nahl, Allah clearly mentions that, إِلَّا مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلِيهِ غَضَبٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ That whoever says words of kufr in a state of torture will be forgiven. This is in the Quran now, right? So, إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ Whoever is forced, but his heart is at peace with Iman, this is the one, Allah says, not a uh, problem. And of course, Ammar ibn Yasir became one of the most famous Sahaba. There are so many authentic hadith about Ammar ibn Yasir in Bukhari, in Muslim, in so many books of hadith. Ammar lived a ripe life. He lived all the way until the fitna of, of Ali and Muawiyah. And Ammar ibn Yasir, the Prophet ﷺ said, Iman has been filled in his heart all the way up until here. It's not just in his heart, it's up until his neck. His iman is just overflowing. And uh, he said to Ammar uh, that uh, he, call, he used to call Ammar ibn as sumayyah as a respect to Sumayyah because of her death, right? He used the nickname of Ammar was ibn as sumayyah So he said, uh, ibn as sumayyati ala al-fitrah, that the son of Sumayyah is upon the pure nature, that whenever he is faced with two choices, he always chooses the more correct of the two. And in the most famous hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir, because it's a political hadith as well, Ammar ibn Yasir, the Prophet uh, said to him, May Allah have mercy on you, O Ammar, you shall be killed by the rebel party. You shall be killed by the rebel party. And subhanAllah, many, many, many years later after this hadith, 40 years after this hadith, in the civil war between Ali and Muawiyah, Ammar chose the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And in the battle of Sifin, the battle of Sifin, he died. He was killed by an arrow from the side of Muawiyah, right? And this hadith was then used as a huge valor, victory point that the more correct side was the side of Ali. Now we as Ahl Sunnah, we never say anything bad about any of the Sahaba. And we say that Ali and Muawiyah both intended good, but the one was closer to the truth than the other. And we don't say evil about the other. And we say Allah will forgive all sides. Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. And that was a great fitna and time of fitna. Uh, but later on we can, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's always easy to analyze after it happens, right? Later on we can say that the more correct side was the side of Ali. Right? And we say this uh, f for the sake of the truth and not because of any uh, political or correctness or reason. The more correct side was the side of Ali. Uh, many other stories as well. Suhaib al-Rumi is the famous story as well. And by the way, th these names, uh, Ammar and Suhaib and Bilal, these three names, they were always mentioned together in the seerah. Why? Because they were very close friends. They were a, a gang of Muslims, a bunch of Muslims, right? Uh, and they were all young. Uh, meaning in their 20s and 30s. Uh, so Ammar would have been the youngest. Ammar, Suhaib, and Bilal. These three. And these three, by the way, these are the three that once uh, the, it was Abu Jahal and Utbah ibn Khalaf and Umayyah ibn Khalaf, all of the leaders of the Quraysh, they began talking with the Prophet and the Prophet became hopeful that yes, they're coming close to Islam. And then these three passed by. Suhaib, Bilal, and Ammar. And so, Abu Jahl said, and he's worried that they're getting sympathetic. Abu Jahl said, O oh Muhammad, how is it possible that if you're upon the truth, these people are following it before us? Look at his evidence is myself, basically, right? If it was true, then I'd be following it. That's his evidence, mashallah. And so how is it possible? 
If you want us to accept your religion, you have to get rid of these people. I think this is an empty threat basically, right? If you really want us to follow, and maybe some of them, maybe Umayyah and others might have been serious about this. Maybe, okay, if you really want us to, we cannot join a faith that has slaves in it. Right? And so Allah revealed in the Quran, Allah revealed in the Quran, do not repel those who are calling bil ghadati wal aishi yuriduna wajhahu. Those who are calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanting His face. Do not prefer to read on the not this verse, the other ayah. Uh, the, I cannot remember the Arabic now, but, but the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling, is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that these are the people, what is it? يَدْعُونَ رَبَّمْ غَدَاتَ وَعَشِيِّ رِذِنَ وَجْهَهُ مَا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ حِسَابِهِمْ بِشَيْءٍ وَمَا مِنْ حِسَابِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِشَيْءٍ فَتَطْرُدَهُمْ فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Surah Al-An'am, correct? Surah Al-An'am. So Allah revealed in Surah Al-An'am verses that is the highest praise for these people. Once again, Suhaib, Bilal, and Ammar are all three together, always mentioned. And so Allah says, if you were to reject them, you would be from the losers, subhanAllah. Look at this ayah. Allah is telling Rasulullah Wasallam, if you reject these three and choose them over these three, you will be the khasirin. Do not get rid of them or else you will be from the uh, Khasirin. And uh, Suhaib al-Rumi, of course al-Rumi means what? The Roman. Was Suhaib a Roman? No, Suhaib was not a Roman. Suhaib was actually a, an Arab. He was actually from Iraq. Suhaib was an Iraqi. Uh, but he was captured by a Byzantine party when he was a young boy. And so he was captured as a young slave, sent to Rome. He grew up in Rome. And he forgot Arabic completely, and he spoke fluent Latin, he became a slave in Rome, and he remembered his roots, he, remember, he knew he was Arab. And so eventually he fled away, and he sold himself, I mean, you, know, you were a slave, you needed to be a slave back then apparently, so he sold himself to some Arabs, or he got into some Arabs, eventually he was sold to Abdullah ibn Jud'an in Mecca. Abdullah ibn Jud'an in Mecca. And ibn Jud'an was one of the more merciful of the slave owners. Um, and so the torture of Suhaib was not as bad, but nonetheless the others tortured him. Ibn Jud'an did not torture him himself, Abu Jahl and others tortured him, but Ibn Jud'an overall dealt with him in a good manner. And uh, he actually made him a business manager, because Ibn Jud'an was a wealthy businessman. So because Suhaib was so intelligent, he knew how to read and write and everything, so uh, he became a business manager, he became wealthy. When Ibn Jud'an died, he became a free man because he wrote in his will that Suhaib, Suhaib is going to be free after I die. So he became a mawla. And so when Ibn Jud'an died, uh, it, uh, the Suhaib decided to immigrate to Medina. And when he was immigrating to Medina, the Quraysh heard about his, this. And so they stopped him on the outskirts. And they approached him as, as a caravan. And Suhaib turned around and he took out his bow and arrow. And he said, you know I am the best sharpshooter, Mark Smith amongst you. And I promise that none of you will be able to touch me until every arrow in my quiver has touched human flesh. And I promise that none of you will be able to touch me until my sword is bent and broken upon your bones and blood. Go ahead, challenge. Ten of them versus one of you. But they didn't love their lives that, they didn't love Suhaib's life that much as their own. And so they just surrounded him, kept on threatening him, until finally they said, Suhaib, you came to us penniless. You came to us without any money, without anything. And now you're leaving us as a rich man, taking our wealth? Give us back all of this money, and then we'll let you go. And this is the way of... You know, you still hear it now that these illegal immigrants come and take over our jobs and as if it belongs to them, as if they would do the jobs that the others are doing. So, I mean, this type of mentality, don't think it's new. Wallahi, when you study human history and anthropology and psychology, been there, done that. Nature of man doesn't change. The, the issues might be, have different fancier names. It's still basic racism and whatnot. So they're attributing all of Suhaib's success to themselves. This is my money, not your money. This is our money. So Suhaib said, is that what you want from me? You want all of my wealth? They said, yes, even the horse that you're riding. SubhanAllah, you can't just leave a man in the desert without a, a camel. Even the, the, the camel that you're riding. So there was no alternative. So Suhaib said, okay, here's the camel, here's my wealth, and the rest of my wealth is buried in such and such a place. Because again, there's no bank accounts, you're going to bury it somewhere. Go there and you shall find the wealth. And so... So Haib al-Rumi became the only Sahabi that we know of who performed the Hijrah 
on foot, walking in the desert without any, not just the clothes on his back, that's all he owned. After being the richest mawla, there was no mawla, there was no freed slave richer than Suhaib. Because he was the business master of Ibn Jud'an. He became the richest mawla. He gave every penny of it in order to free himself and go to Medina. And it is said, the books of Sirah say that he was literally crawling on all fours. Because he doesn't have food and drink except what he could find in the desert. He was literally crawling on all fours by the time he got to Quba. And that's where he met the Prophet. This is in Quba, right after the Hijrah. The Prophet stayed there for a few days, as you know. So he crawled on all fours to Quba, his complete, emaciated, dehydrated, about to collapse and die, uh, dusty, disheveled. And the Prophet himself wiped the dust off of him and gave him food and drink. And he smiled and he said to Suhaib, uh, tijaratu ya Suhaib, tijara, that your business transaction has been the most successful. And Suhaib said, no one could have told you about this, Ya Rasulullah, except Jibreel. <laughs> Nobody knows except Jibreel. And Allah revealed in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-Baqarah is the first revelation in Medina, Allah revealed a beautiful verse. That is because of Suhaib al-Rumi. It's attached to Suhaib al-Rumi. And that is, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ there are those who sell everything they have in themselves in order to uh, benefit, in order to get the, uh, uh, the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this, of course, are some of the stories of the early uh, tortures. Um, and the last point that we don't have time to talk about, inshallah, we'll talk about this uh, later on, uh, a few weeks from now. Uh, the last tactic that they did is the tactic of the boycott. And the boycott is its own topic that we're going to talk about. Inshallah, I will call it a day today because I, I, for those of you who came late, I said I'm not feeling well. There was a bit of an issue yesterday with my leg was infected and so I, uh, I'm taking some medication for that. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we will continue next Wednesday. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll continue with the sacrifices of the Prophet for himself. What happened to him and the tortures that he underwent. His tortures were different than the tortures of Bilal. But he was physically harassed and intimidated as well. And the question, and we're going to, talk, going to talk about this a lot next week, inshallah. The question, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow such hardship? What was the wisdom? Why couldn't he just have made things easy and given everything to everybody in day one? Why such struggle? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. And this is a question Khabbab is asking in the process of them. It's a question of great wisdom, inshallah, next week. The struggles of the Prophet and asking ourselves why this uh, occurred. Uh, I will, inshallah, stop over here and open the floor for a few minutes of QA and then we'll pray Salat al Maghrib, inshallah. Yes, questions? Yes. Is there an association between the word Mawla and Mawlana? Yes, of course. Mawla is Mawla. Mawla is Mawlana. Mawlana means my Mawla, our Mawla. That's the exact same word, not just association. Why why do we call our Lord Mawla? Anta Maulana. Right? Uh, the word Wali means close friend, protector. It means a person of uh, deep sympathies and bonds. Right? And so Wali could mean what wilaya or, or wali could mean that Allahu waliyu alladhina amanu Allah is the protector of those who believe Allahu maulana Allah is the one who protects us in this case the slaves are the maulas meaning that if you don't have a US passport you don't have the Qurashi passport right you're not Qurashi how can you get the Qurashi passport you will become the Mawla of the Quraysh. The Quraysh will give you protection. Okay, so the status of that passport or the whatever we're going to call it, the Quraysh have given it to you. And this is what, why we call them Mawla. Now, uh, calling the scholars Mawla is something that's Indian Pakistani, it's not Arab. Right? The Arabs do not call their, their scholars uh, Mawla. Uh, but we say Mawlana Sahab. Right? We say Mawlana. 
which is uh, from, and then you get the Iranian mullah from this, right, the mullah. Uh, this is a hist uh, uh, traditional thing, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just the one who's protecting us through his knowledge, because of his knowledge, right? There's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, Allah's names can be used by the creation with some conditions, as long as the alif lam is not there, generally speaking, right? Allah is al mawla Allah is ar rauf Allah is ar rahim Allah is as samir al basir but you are samir and i am samir you are basir and i am basir i can hear and see we are not as samir and al basir so to use the word mawla in a generic sense is permitted but to use it and say al al mawla there is only one al mawla and that is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anta mawlana okay questions sisters have any questions yes good um, what, what what determines uh, what revelations were included as part of the Quran versus those that are maybe narrated by Hadith? What determines what is Quran versus those narrated by Hadith? Do you mean Hadith Qudsi? Well, revelations. See, the ahadith are a different type of revelation. The ahadith are a revelation. We believe that the Prophet's ahadith وسلم, are a type of wahi. Because Allah says in Surah Al-Najm, He does not speak of His own desires. Rather, it is from Allah. Right? And in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah says, قَدْ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ Allah has given you the kitab and hikmah. No, that's in Surah An-Nisa. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْنَا فِي بِيُتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ The wives are told, remember what was recited in your houses. The wives of the Prophet are told, remember what is recited in your houses from the ayat of Allah and the hikmah. Therefore, there's something being recited in the Prophet's house other than the ayatullah, and that is, what else is being recited? The sunnah, the hadith, right? So Allah calls the hadith hikmah. And Allah says anything that he says is the truth. And the Prophet ﷺ himself said, nothing comes from here except the truth from Allah. The Prophet ﷺ is not allowed to say anything uh, that is false. And therefore, we believe it is a type of wahi, but the wahi that he has is a very different type of wahi than the Qur'an. The Qur'an is inspired in wording and meaning. The actual love comes from Allah. The alfaz are inspired by Allah and recited. But the ahadith, the meanings can come from the process, but the concept comes from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So there is a difference between Qur'an and hadith in that the ahadith are not wordings from Allah. This is the process of speaking as a human being. But his speech will be divinely protected as a prophet. The Qur'an is coming, it's tilawa, it's from Allah. And Allah is re reciting it. And therefore it has a, spa uh, uh, a station that is more sacred than hadith. Does that answer your question? or Okay. Two more questions, inshallah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Rasulullah, uh, all his conversations are hadith. All of the conversations, the word hadith has and sunnah has many meanings depending on how you use it. Uh, when we use it as the scholars, the scholars of the seerah or the scholars of the sunnah, a hadith is every single statement of the Prophet ﷺ. Every statement of the Prophet ﷺ is a hadith. Therefore, whatever he said is a hadith. Even his jokes, وسلم, even his jokes, and he did crack jokes by the way. Our Prophet ﷺ cracked jokes. He had a sense of humor. And there are many stories, inshallah, one day I might give a lecture about the humor of the Prophet ﷺ. Even his jokes are statements of fact. We derive aqidah and fiqh and adab from his jokes, right? I mean, you all know the famous joke of the old lady, right? Yes. The old lady. It's a theological point that we derive. All people will not enter Jannah. They're all going to be young. It's a joke he cracked at the old lady, that old ladies are not going to enter Jannah, right? And the old lady started wailing and crying, he goes, Ya Amatah, oh my dear mother, yes, old ladies are not going to enter Jannah, Allah will cause you to become a young lady, then I'll cause you to enter Jannah, right? It's a theological point of benefit that we derive. Uh, and fiqh as well, and other things that we derive. Uh, you know, the famous hadith that the Prophet was on his deathbed, and... Uh, uh, you know, Aisha fell sick as well on his deathbed. Aisha had a fever as well, right? And, uh, you know, she began complaining about uh, her head, her head. 
uh, and you know, she, uh, she felt she's about, I mean, you know, she's a young girl, she felt she's about to die or something. And so the Prophet is joking with her and saying, Yani, you know, what is the matter with you if you die? Why are you worried? You're going to be so fortunate and blessed that I'm going to wash your, you know, he knows he's about to die, by the way. So he's cracking jokes on his deathbed to make the mood easier for Aisha to bear, right? And so he tells Aisha, if, you're, if you die, even though he's about to die. If you die, alhamdulillah, I'll wash your dead body, right? And I'll pray over you. And I'll, you know, give you a dafin. I mean, what more can you want, right? So he's joking with his wife. And then, of course, Aisha replies, I'm sure you're waiting for that day because then you won't have anybody between you and your other wives, right? Because Aisha was the main barrier. Yani she was the one, mashallah, c controlling any of the in this matter, right? And so from this, we derive the fiqhi perspective point, which, by the way, our culture does not agree with, the Hanafi culture, but uh, the fiqhi point, husbands can wash the, wa the bodies of their wives and vice versa. Because he clearly said, I would wash your body, right? And pray over you and whatnot. So we derive a fiqh from this joke. That, you know, there's a cultural thing, the nikah breaks. This is not true at all. This is just a cultural thing. Uh, and the husband cannot... This is clearly in Sahih Bukhari hadith. So everything that comes from the Prophet is a hadith. No questions about that. Final question in the back. Or two questions, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Do we have a hadith from Bilal? Yes, we do. Muslim Imam Ahmed has a whole section of a hadith of Bilal. It's a good question. Let me look up some of them. I don't remember any of them offhand, what he actually narrated. But Bilal is mentioned in so many hadith, and there is Musnad Bilal. I am 100% sure. Some things go back to him. A very good question for me to look up, inshallah. Remind me again, and inshallah, next week, hopefully, inshallah, I will bring something for you. Yes, sister. Um, I have never heard a hadith, the one who will conquer Turkey. Constantinople. <laughs> Big difference. There is a hadith about the conqueror of Constantinople, and there's a praise about him. And um, Constantinople was conquered in 1493 by Muhammad, uh, so the Magnificent. Uh, Muhammad the Magnificent, right? Or is it Muhammad al Fatih? Muhammad al Fatih. Muhammad the Conqueror, not Suleiman is the Magnificent, sorry. It's Muhammad al-Fatih, Muhammad the Conqueror. Um, so there is a hadith about that, and inshallah we hope the praise will get to him uh, and applies to him. As for the difference between Quran and Hadith Qudsi, the strongest opinion seems to be that the only difference is that Hadith Qudsi has not been preserved in wording. It was revealed in wording, but it has been preserved in wording. And so the same Hadith Qudsi we find it in many different wordings. Bukhari might have one wording, Muslim might have another. So the Hadith Qudsi have been narrated by meaning, just like the other Hadith. But the Quran has not been narrated by meaning. The Quran has only been narrated by words. Actual words has been narrated. So that's the main difference between Quran and Hadith Qudsi. Okay. Inshallah, hopefully next week we'll have a regular longer session. Wazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We can give the adhan. Bismillah.